All right, we are here this evening to do something that we don't normally do in the context of a local church, and that's spending a little bit of time trying to think well or think how to think well, which means biblically, about warfare. Helps to start with a definition. So what is warfare? Definition I'll give it tonight is warfare is the managed application of violence to an end. Uh, if I borrow from a guy who is now retired, former General Mark Welsh, who was an F-16 pilot, he was a commandant of cadets for part of the time I was at the Air Force Academy, eventually retired as the chief of staff of the Air Force. Um, he said that warfare involves killing people and breaking things. <laughs> which is a really clear, concise, and pretty stark way to put what we're talking about, but it's very true. Now, we could be here talking tonight about warfare and thinking biblically about warfare for any number of reasons. We could be here because of the last year and a half in Ukraine and everything that's happened in Ukraine, much of which, it's important to remember, our brothers and sisters in Christ have been directly involved with. Um, we could be here because of the very present, even kind of growing concern in our government over the potential for future warfare with the People's Republic of China. It's a real thing. But obviously tonight we are here most intensely and most directly, most specifically because of what we have watched and heard out of Israel over the last two and a half weeks now. And I don't have to rehearse that for us, but for form's sake, completeness sake, if nothing else, we're thinking about Israel because on October 7th, Hamas, which is an organization our government has labeled a terrorist group, attacked Israel. And in doing so, the last number that I saw, which was a couple days ago now, killed somewhere around 1,400 people, um, 20 of whom, 20 plus of whom were Americans and took another almost 200 hostage, again, including some number of Americans. Now, the details of that attack are grotesque, um, they're heavy, and we don't need to rehearse the nitty-gritty details tonight. I, I'm sure all of you guys have heard or read more than you have cared to know. Um, but almost immediately, in response to that attack, Israel began dealing with Hamas, namely with airstrikes in the Gaza Strip. And, and those attacks, Israel against Hamas, remain ongoing right now and will probably result in some sort of ground offensive or operation into Gaza, probably in the near future. And, and all of this, I think for a number of different reasons, have struck pretty close to home. And I think especially in the United States, what's happened in Israel has just resonated with a real sort of intensity that even other places in the world that might not have the same tenor or tone. Okay, all of that now compels us as the church to stop and think, well, how do, how do we process this? What does it mean to think biblically or then as a Christian about warfare? Now, what I'm going to do for my time of talking here, I'm going to talk for a little bit first from scripture to help us think about this thing warfare, and then we're going to shift a little bit into church history just very briefly and we're going to work our way down to two specific ideas, namely just war theory and then an associated concept called the law of armed conflict. Now, I'm going to try to be thorough here without going too long. I can go too long on this, so I'm going to try not to go too long. And when I'm done talking, then I want to open the floor. And, and what we want to do is sort of discuss this out amongst us a little bit. What have you been thinking as you watch the news over the last two and a half weeks, what questions have come to mind or what things have you noticed and just it's really sort of weighed on you or you, you've had to work through it and think about it. Um, it's worth remembering while we do this, for us, this is a little bit of an academic exercise tonight, but it's really not because right now our brothers and sisters in Christ are living this, both in Israel and in the Gaza Strip. And we're called by the church to think clearly, we're called by the Lord as the church, to think clearly and biblically about the world around us. So this isn't just a mere academic kind of thing. This is a discipleship thing that we're trying to get after with each other. Let me pray, and we're going to jump in. 
Father, we just acknowledge that this is really, it's, it's serious business tonight. And the question we're asking is an important one. Um, it can even be a heavy one. Uh, Father, we might find ourselves in conversation with others about it. I pray that you would teach us tonight by your spirit through your word. And Lord, help us to encourage one another and, and help each other's thinking be sharpened and made more faithful as we spend the time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, we're going to begin with God. It's always a good place to start. We're going to begin with God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who is sovereign and righteous and sinless. And you know, because Genesis has told us that God created man, male and female, in his image. Genesis 1, 27. I didn't put the reference down, but I think I got that right. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female, he created them. And look, there's a really key point here. For Christians who are trying to think biblically about this thing, warfare, everything that we're going to say tonight stands on God as creator. If you think that humanity is just a cosmic accident, a material oops of the universe, then you really have no foundation whatsoever to stand on in looking at what's happened in Israel and saying that's wrong, or that's evil, or that's immoral. From God as creator, we move on to human beings and to our sinful rebellion against God. So Adam and Eve in the garden, they listen to Satan and they rebel against God, against their creator in the garden of Eden. In a short time after their disobedience. Now what short means, we don't know exactly. Let's, let's just say 30 years, give or take. In a short time after their disobedience, that rebellion results in violence, one man against another. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. If you fast forward just 15 verses later, not very far in the narrative of Genesis, several generations, 15 verses, we have Cain's descendant Lamech, Cain's immoral descendant Lamech, who goes and boasts to not his one wife, but his two wives about his violent deed. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. Now that spiral of sin and violence in Genesis, it just continues. We saw it, we went through Genesis. It continues up to Genesis 6, by which point the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually and the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. Can you imagine the sort of violence that must have been at work in Noah's day? And we know what comes next. The flood comes. God judges humanity in his just wrath and in doing that he graciously, he mercifully saves Noah and his family. Now, when Noah and his family come off of the ark in Genesis chapter 9, God reissues them the same sort of mandate that he gave first to Adam and Eve. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, Genesis 9 verse 1. But there's a difference. This mandate to Noah is going to come with stipulations that the original mandate didn't have. There's stipulations that God adds to this mandate because of this thing, sin. God says to Noah, And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. So now, along with this Mandate this cultural mandate, there comes a demand, a God-given requirement for justice in the face of unjustified violence. Now that's really important because out of this requirement of God for justice in the face of unjustified violence, out of that is going to flow both the need for and the gift of government, human government. If you're going to accomplish Genesis 9, verses 5 and 6, which is what I just read, if you're going to do that as human beings, 
then you need legitimate governing authority. You need an authority that's able to say this was unjustified violence and now we're going to establish, we're going to impose God's given standard for dealing with that. Now, we won't trace the story of the nation or the nation state or legitimate governing authorities through scripture, but just suffice it to say that the nation, and by the nation now, I mean a legitimate, coherent, political entity that's exercising authority over a place and a people. That's what I mean by a nation now, a nation state. That nation state is a gift and a tool of God to accomplish his purpose in the world. So by way of example, we have Job in Job chapter 12, verse 23, saying, He, Yahweh, makes nations great and he destroys them. He enlarges nations and leads them away. Now, as God's instrument, the nation state, and I'll just refer to the state going forward here. As God's instrument, the state carries responsibilities and authorities that don't belong to people as individuals, including the responsibility and the authority to make war when it's necessary. War itself is not inherently a good thing, but war is sometimes a necessary thing. So, for example, when God sends Israel into Canaan, into the promised land, he commands them to carry out warfare against the Canaanites as God's tool of judgment on long-standing, unrepentant sin. Similarly, when God's own people sin, when they live in long-standing, unrepentant <clears throat> sin against their God, God brings various nations against them in war, most particularly Assyria and then Babylon. Now, we could multiply examples across the scope of Scripture. We won't do that. We'll just go right to the Apostle Paul. In Romans 13, 1 through 4, he writes this. He says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Now, there's a lot packed in there about governing authorities and how we should deal with them. And, and we had to do some different thinking about that. Not different. We had to do more precise thinking about that throughout the course of COVID. That, that wasn't easy. But for our purposes tonight, it's sufficient to note that legitimate governing authority has not only the right, but also the responsibility to bear the sword, including when it's necessary to do so in warfare. Not only the right, but also the responsibility. That means then that when a state bears the sword well, warfare becomes not only a necessary activity, but even a noble endeavor. And by noble endeavor, I mean something that is God-honoring. An endeavor that's worthy of support and respect and honor. Even though it's warfare. Even though it comes about as a result of sin. That's why we find David in Psalm 144 verse 1 saying, Blessed be the Lord my rock who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. That's why in Proverbs 20 verse 18, Plans are established by counsel, by wise guidance wage war. Or Proverbs 24, A wise man is full of strength and a man of knowledge enhances his might for by wise guidance you can wage your war, and in abundance of counselors, there is victory. So warfare that is well done is a noble endeavor, even as war itself is a thing of moral hazard. Because the moment you enter into warfare, armed conflict, there's all kinds of pitfalls for sin and injustice, especially for those who are going to enter into it flippantly or in pride. All right. Now, all of that that I've said thus far, I've really been speaking about 
kind of the state writ large, okay? the state at war. And I haven't so much been speaking about individual warriors, right? Individual soldiers or airmen or Marines or sailors or guardians. Um, the Bible has a lot to say to and for an individual warrior. Most of that is sort of beyond the scope tonight. But let me just read you a summary statement that will help us kind of think about the individual warrior in, in combat, as it were. And this summary statement is coming out of kind of four criteria about how a Christian warrior should fight. Namely, for the glory of God, ruled by the love of God, with alacrity, meaning intensity, even, even desire to a certain degree, and by wise guidance. What can we finally say about the Christian warrior with reference to their enemy? We can say that the warrior who loves his enemy kills not for pleasure, but only as a matter of necessity, mandated by his role as an instrument of God-ordained authority. The warrior who loves his enemy is patient with a captured adversary, is kind toward a wounded prisoner, does not brag over a victory won, and eschews arrogant displays of strength. A warrior who loves his enemy treats a defeated adversary with respect and gives no thought to exacting personal revenge on a capitulated foe. In the final analysis, a, a warrior seeks God's glory in the profession of arms by living out 1 Corinthians 13, even in the face of hostility. The Christian warrior does their duty to its fullest in broken acknowledgement of their own sin. All the while, they desire that the enemy would see and know the glory of God and that they would know God in and through Jesus Christ and in so doing find life. Now, in the end, for a Christian involved in warfare, it's the knowledge of and the assurance of God's sovereignty, even over this thing, war, that gives them hope in the middle of battle, and even hope when they are serving a less-than-godly political master. All right, that's all coming from Scripture. Now, in a moment, I want to move over to church history for, for just a brief few minutes. But before we do that, let me just try to summarize kind of where we've gotten to out of the Bible thinking about this thing, warfare. This is not by any means exhausting the Bible's thoughts about war. But what can we say? We can say three things, I think. First, war is the result of sin. And war persists in the world because of competitive, self-serving prideful human beings who live apart from Christ in unrepentant sin and therefore clash with one another. I have lodged in my brain, there was a, one of the halls at the Air Force Academy in Vandenberg Hall, one of the hallways, on the wall was a mural that was painted and underneath it was a statement attributed to Plato that says, only the dead have seen the end of war. If you're a pacifist, you're bound to be disappointed. Second statement. It is the duty of governing authorities established by God to sometimes restrain sin through war. And then third, when a state bears the sword well, warfare is a noble task. And it behooves the Christian warrior to help the state bear the sword well. Okay. Now, from that foundation of Scripture... Over the centuries of the life of the church, the Christian church has done a whole lot of thinking and reasoning about warfare. And much of that thinking and reasoning has been driven by or compelled by the circumstances of history in which, according to God's providence, we find ourselves. Now, I am totally incompetent for the task of trying to trace out all that history. That's beyond my capacity. It's certainly beyond our capacity tonight. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to name a few names. I'm going to read you a few statements. And all I'm trying to do is give us a taste. As we get down to these two ideas, I'm trying to give us a taste of how the church has thought about war across time. So for instance, we have Augustine, the famous bishop of Hippo in North Africa. He was a profound theologian and church leader from the years 354 to 430 AD, which was a really happening time in the demise of the Roman Empire. Augustine wrote, But the wise man, they say, will wage just wars 
Surely if he remembers that he is a human being, he will rather lament the fact that he is faced with the necessity of waging just wars. For if they were not just, he would not have to engage in them, and consequently there would be no wars for a wise man. You see, Augustine's living with this sort of dual sense of the tragic mis misery, but also the awful necessity of war, of a just war. If you move forward six centuries or so, actually probably more like eight centuries or so, from Augustine, we get down to the days of Thomas Aquinas, who was a um, priest, an Italian priest and theologian who lived in the mid-1200s. And Aquinas spelled out in his, in his systematic theology, he described three criteria for a just war. Namely, you had to have a right authority, you had to have a just cause, and you had to have a right intention. We're actually going to come back to those. You'll see them pop up again. Move forward a few more centuries and you get down to John Calvin, one of the reformers in the mid-1500s. John Calvin wrote, Now because it is sometimes necessary for kings and nations to undertake war for the sake of retribution, we may accordingly regard as legitimate wars waged with that end in view. Yet here, magistrates, that means governing authorities, should be on their guard so as not to give way to the slightest stirring of passion. On the contrary, if they have to inflict some punishment, they must refrain from anger, hatred, or unduly harsh severity. Indeed, as Augustine says, for the sake of common humanity, they should have pity on the person whose misdeeds they punish. In short, when it comes to the shedding of blood, magistrates must not allow themselves to be swept away by personal feeling but should be moved by public interest. The 1689 London Baptist Confession, or Second London Baptist Confession, I won't read it for the sake of time tonight, but says something very similar. Basically, God has given to governing authorities this responsibility to bear the sword, and therefore, it's right for Christians in the service of those authorities to do the same. Um, I will also skip by a statement by the Confessing Church, in Hitler's Germany in 1934, the Confessing Church was the church seeking to live outside of the state church in Germany that was hijacked by the Nazi party. And the Confessing Church issued something called the Barman Declaration in which, just like these folks that came before them, they confessed the authority of the state to provide for peace and justice, including by the threat and exercise of force when necessary. I will take us, and this will be the last guy I mentioned for this purpose, I'll take us down to C.S. Lewis, who makes his way into some of our lifetime. C.S. Lewis, who himself saw military service in the trenches of World War I, and in his Mere Christianity, he writes this. The idea of the knight, the Christian in arms for the defense of a good cause, is one of the great Christian ideas. War is a dreadful thing, and I can respect an honest pacifist, though I think he is entirely mistaken. What I cannot understand is this sort of semi-pacifism you get nowadays, which gives people the idea that though you have to fight, you ought to do it with a long face, and as if you were ashamed of it. It is that feeling that robs, a lot of ma robs lots of magnificent young Christians in the services of something they have a right to do, something which is the natural accompaniment of courage, a kind of gaiety and wholeheartedness. That's pretty interesting. <laughs> Try to see us, Lewis. He's not talking about killing for the sake of killing. He's not talking about enjoying killing. He's talking about serving with alacrity, consistent with the governing authorities that God has put someone under. That's just a taste throughout time of how the church has thought about and wrestled with this thing called war. Now, all of that leads us down to something called just war theory and the law of armed conflict. Just war theory is the fruit of biblical teaching and Christian reflection <laughs> on warfare. And it's fruit that has had and continues to have a really profound impact on the thinking even of people who explicitly reject Jesus. So in a moment, we're going to talk about this just war theory and law of armed conflict. Know that all of this is coming particularly out of 
a Christian worldview and Christian reflection from God's word about this thing called war, and it has a huge impact on our world today, even on the legal structures that we live under today. This impact from just war theory um, exists because of the way that I think this just war thinking describes the sort of moral impulse, though it's corrupted by sin, the sort of moral impulse that God has given us as people created in his image, people who live under that Noahic covenant from Genesis 9 verse 1. What is just war theory? Just war theory is a way of describing a just war, a war that is worthy of being waged. And because the roots of just war theory are Christian, because they come out of biblical reflection, then just war theory is actually a really helpful tool for Christians to try to think well about this tragic necessity called war. Now, according to just war theory, for a war to be just, and therefore worthy of being waged, two conditions must be met. The war must be use ad bellum. This is Latin, right? We're getting a little bit of Latin tonight. It must be use ad bellum, and it must be use and bello. Use ad bellum means the war itself must be just in the first place, and then use and bello, the war must be fought justly. The war's got to be just in the first place, and then conduct in the war has to be just if this war is to be worthy of being waged. Now, I'm not going to belabor all this, but I do just want to walk through very briefly and touch on these points because it's good for us to think about them. Use ad bellum, the war being just in and of itself, refers to six principles that define whether a war is just in the first place, whether or not it's even worthy of being entered into. And you'll hear echoes now of what Aquinas thought about back in the mid-1200s. Eus ad bellum says that a war must be prompted by a just cause. It's got to be a just cause that undergirds this thing. It must be initiated by a legitimate authority, meaning the war has got to be started by an authority that has a legitimate right to wage warfare in the first place. It has to occur with right intentions, meaning this war can't be an excuse to achieve something other than a just end. Now, there may be all kinds of things that come about as a result of a war, but you can't start a war for an end that isn't just. It must be undertaken with a reasonable expectation of success. You shouldn't fight a war in futility. You shouldn't fight it needlessly. It must proceed with regard for proportionality, meaning you give thought to the relative weight of good to be achieved versus harm suffered if you kick off this armed conflict. And finally, you go to war as a matter of last resort meaning there isn't any other way to reach this necessary, just end. Now, if, if those things pertain, and if the war itself in itself is just, Eus and Bello says that when you fight this conflict, you need to fight justly. And here, I'll take us to something called the law of armed conflict. And, and I'm, I'm speaking now from the perspective of the U.S. military because LOAC, the Law of Armed Conflict, is a definitive legal standard, the purpose of which is to help us abide by this principle of use and bellum, fighting war justly. And again, for the Christian, LOAC is a really helpful tool because it flows from this biblical foundation. It's a helpful tool for thinking about biblical standards of justice in the middle of an activity that is morally hazardous, highly morally hazardous, like warfare. Loak says that when a military fights, it must observe five principles. The principle of military necessity, which means you only use the degree and the kind of force that's necessary to accomplish a military objective. So for instance, if you're going to strike a target, you strike that target because the destruction of that target will afford you a military advantage in defeating your enemy. 
You don't blow things up just for the sake of blowing them up. You don't loot and pillage. That's not military necessity. Second is the principle of humanity. Even in warfare, you recognize the dignity of the individual human being and you seek to minimize or mitigate human suffering. You don't inflict more pain and destruction than is needed to accomplish that legitimate military purpose. That's a principle of humanity. Third is the principle of proportionality. Similar to over here, use ad bellum. You balance the expected loss of non-combatant life or the expected damage to protected property. You balance that against the direct military advantage that's going to be gained by any action in conflict. So, for instance, blowing up a whole city block of non-combatants because there's one guy on the street holding an AK-47, that's probably not justified. But it might be. If that guy holding the AK-47 is, for, for instance, the active battlefield commander for Hamas, then it might be, it might be right to blow up that entire city block, come what may. The principle of chivalry. That's odd, right? You think of knights and jousting and armor and all that. The principle of chivalry forbids dishonorable, treacherous means or dishonorable expedience or dishonorable conduct during armed conflict. Now, don't misunderstand this, right? It doesn't mean you can't use something called military deception in combat. You definitely can, and if you're smart, you do. No, what this is talking about, the principle of chivalry is trying to limit the extreme cruelty that lurks as an inherent danger in combat. Again, this is a morally hazardous undertaking, and the principle of chivalry is trying to limit the extreme cruelty. It's trying to work against the sort of heinous, perverse, grotesque conduct that we've heard way too much about in the news at the hands of Hamas. And then lastly, the principle of distinction. A military must distinguish as best it can between combatants and non-combatants, between military objects and protected property or places. Combatants or a military object or an object or a place, the destruction of which would incur a military advantage, those are lawful targets. Anything else is not. Now, because it's warfare, sadly, there's always going to be that thing called collateral damage. There's always going to be innocent civilians who die in war. That's the nature of something that exists because of sin in a broken world. Now, it's important to note, right, these are principles that help us get after this thing called usembello. These principles of the law of armed conflict, they are not a checklist. These aren't always black and white. They're not always easy to apply in a given situation. Fighting a war justly needs wisdom, which, strangely enough, is exactly what God's word told us already in Proverbs 20. By wise guidance, wage war. Loak needs wisdom. And here's a foot stomp. Media, especially media that has an agenda, is almost always going to be a really poor guide for Loak. So as you're watching the news now, this week, and into the future, and you hear things about what Israel's done or not done, be very careful about what you think or believe based on what you see in the media. All right. Now, if we go back all the way to the beginning, to God as creator, and we apply this chain from scripture all the way down to this thing called Loak, what can we say about events in the Middle East right now. I think we can say three things at least. We can say that the attack by Hamas against Israel was a brutal, horrendous, despicable act of unjustified violence. It was evil. We can say that the government of Israel has not only the right, it actually has the moral responsibility to wage war in response, even to the point of, of, of eradicating Hamas as a coherent organization. That's not only a right of Israel, that is quite likely a responsibility of Israel. 
So responsibility to wage war, how far and to what extent is going to be a question of wisdom. Israel's war against Hamas is and will be just from the perspective of use ad bellum. And then third, we can say that in prosecuting this war, it's the responsibility of Israel, it's particularly the responsibility of the IDF, to act with justice. Use and bellow matters, and Israel ought to do all it can to abide by this thing called LOAC. All right, I'm about to close, and we'll open it up for thoughts and conversation and questions. But before we do that, let's just remind ourselves, because we're Christians, let's remind ourselves of the sure gospel hope that we have and it stands fast in the face of the worst warfare we could ever imagine. Here it is from the words of the prophet Micah. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. And it shall be lifted up above the hills and people shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples, and shall decide disputes for strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That's a sure gospel promise in Jesus Christ. And that's our hope. Even when we have to do something like think for a night about how to think well, biblically, about warfare. All right. That's all I've got to say in a formal sense. We're going to stop recording this. So that we are free to talk and think and ask each other questions.